Friends, give it up for David York. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, the surprising part of that whole bio is not that I'm from Utah and that I have five children, but it's that I'm from Utah, I have five children, and that's with just one wife. Uh, so... Um, in fact, some people are surprised that there actually are any evangelicals uh, in Utah, and there are. In fact, when the other four of us all get together and talk about it, we're always, <laughs> we're always surprised uh, at that thought. Um, this morning, um, I want to talk to you, I want to start by talking to you about a word. Um, each year I get to, uh, I get to, I go to uh, the Heckerling Tax Conference. It's in Orlando. It's actually the largest estate planning Gathering. I think it's the largest CLE conference in the, in the nation. About 3,500 lawyers uh, go to that each year. It's like Woodstock for nerds. Uh, and we talk about what our favorite tax code section, as if we could ever pick one. Um, but uh, in that, um, one of the word, there's a word that constantly you see pop up. And I want to start by talking about that word today. And that word is legacy. Um, and so what is uh, legacy and what does legacy mean? Um, well, there's two definitions of legacy, one that we tend to focus on in estate planning, and that is an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. But it's the second one that I want to focus on today, and that is a thing handed down by a predecessor. Um, and that's the definition that I think is capturing the, the hearts and minds of an increasing number of people today. When it comes to a, a legacy, I think that there are five essential truths that we need to understand about that word. Uh, the first is that legacy is so much more than money. Um, we too often marginalize the word, and when we do and when we equate legacy to finances, uh, we lose a lot of the richness of it. I want to give you a number. $110,974 and 62 cents. For those of you who don't recognize that number, that was the value of the estate of Abraham Lincoln when he, after he was assassinated in 1865. But I don't think anyone would equate the value of Abraham Lincoln to $110,974. You only need to walk the streets of Washington, D.C., or even read just a little bit of American history to recognize that not only was he the most impactful uh, person to ever live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But I believe that if he were alive today, his wit and wisdom would likely make him the greatest tweeter of all time. Um, so now, that's, that's, uh, now let's get real. Number two, legacy is not neutral. The, too often we think of the term, of the word legacy in a positive sense. But the reality is it can be a, both a positive or a negative. The reality is um, that in the United States today, we still live the legacy of slavery and the impact that it has had on our country. Negative family legacies can include things like addiction or dysfunctional communication. A third, and this is one that clients wrestle with, is legacy is not optional. We can't choose whether or not to leave a legacy. We can't opt out of that. Um, I, I had a client once who said, you know, I'm not sure if I want to leave a legacy. I might, I might just give all my assets away. That's a legacy, okay? It's a legacy to your family. It's a legacy to where those, those assets go. Legacies are not optional. Fourth, uh, and I'm going to make the case for this more in just a minute, but I think people are more legacy-minded today than they've been for a long, long time. The reality is when you are struggling for survival, and trying to care for yourself and care for your family, it's hard to think into the future. But we have the opportunity and the responsibility today to really think about legacy. So I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And then fifth is legacies can be changed. Um, our, our legacies are constantly shifting and our stories are constantly changing. I was listening to Andy Stanley the other day and he said roughly this. Uh, he said... Live your story today like you want your story told tomorrow. You know, it's very easy to look back and see those things that impacted our lives and impacted the lives of, the, of others. But the reality is each day that we live, we are making our story and the story of 
our legacy. Uh, to give you an example of that, I want to give you the CV of a man named John. John was born in 1725 in London, England. Mother died when he was six years old. He was raised by a, a mean stepmother uh, while his father was away at sea. Uh, at 11, he apprenticed on a ship, uh, but he was so disobedient that he was actually conscripted into the Navy. Um, he openly would mock his captain. In fact, he was credited with having invented several of the swear words that we still use today. Um, he got into so many fights that the, the Navy got sick of him and actually sold him into slavery. But then once he actually got out of slavery, he decided to go into the slave trading business and became a, a captain of a slave ship. Um, now, fortunately, that's not the end of his story. He had a few near-death experiences, and that led him to a change of profession. He actually went from being a captain of a ship into theology at age 33. At age 48, he heard a, a sermon on New Year's Day, and he turned that sermon into a hymn. Um, it's estimated that that hymn has appeared on more than 11,000 different albums, uh, the most covered song in um, uh, world history. To give you an idea, the next most covered song, anyone want to take a guess what it is? Well, that's the, this is the second most is um, uh, Yesterday by the Beatles at 4,000. Uh, the hymn he wrote, 11,000. It's been sung by Stephen Tyler, Whitney Houston, and Meryl Streep. Um, and obviously, that was John Newton. And I think his words serve as an anthem uh, for change legacies. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That is a story of a legacy that can change. So with that, um, I want to start this morning by laying out what I see, and not just what I see in my own practice uh, and anecdotally, but empirically what I see as the current state of wealth transfer in the U.S. today. So um, first is that wealth is undirected. While 72% of high net worth individuals uh, think it's important to leave an inheritance to their children, only 20% believe that their children are prepared to handle the wealth that they'll transfer to them. Although more than half of high net worth individuals believe that their family would benefit from, the, from formal principles to guide the purpose and meaning of their wealth, only 10% have actually put together those. 70% um, of family-owned businesses want to transition from one generation to the next. Only 12% actually make it to just the third generation. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of stats at you. I think we're going to have uh, these in slides. Uh, if you want to give me a card, we wrote an article called uh, Grats versus Gratitude that captures a lot of these. But... Um, and if you give me a card, I'd be happy to send you that article. The second is that parents are procrastinating. Uh, there was a study done. They said, what, what age do you think you should start preparing your kids for wealth transfer? They said age 18. I think that's too old. I think you need to start sooner. Then they said, what age are you actually doing it? On average, it was 27. Um, less than half of high net worth parents have executed a will. 30% have done nothing when it comes to estate planning. I don't think it's because they're uninformed. I think it's because they're uninspired. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Only 35% have begun educating their kids and more than half plan on transferring nothing to them, doing nothing to prepare them um, before their passing. Next, uh, kids are left in the dark. This is, a, this is an interesting study. They went to kids and they um, said, um, what kind of financial education do you receive from uh, personally. And half said, well, we have general family conversations. That means in half, they don't even have general family conversations, okay? Um, less than half receive information from their financial advisor. Only 19% receive financial literacy programs offered by their financial advisor. Um, only 16% have family meetings, uh, and only 15% have literacy, uh, financial literacy programs offered to them by professional advisors. They then went and asked the kids, what do you find the most beneficial? What did the kids say was the most beneficial? They said it was all helpful. 
But they said the most helpful was the financial literacy programs offered by financial advisors. Uh, then family meetings, then uh, general programs, reviewing information and family conversations. In other words, what they said was, what the families do the least often is what we find the most helpful. What the families do the most often is what we found the least helpful. So there's a complete disconnect between what the kids are saying they need and what they're being provided. Um, next is errors are not directed. Um, while 72% of heirs are generally made aware of the value of the inheritance they're going to receive, only 31% are told uh, by the parents how they'd like to see the wealth used. Only 21% are told about the structure. Only 17% are introduced to the individuals who will ultimately oversee that. I think there's an interesting corollary statistic there. Studies show about 85% of the time when a client dies, the children change the financial advisor. Why do they change the financial advisor? Because they don't know the financial advisor. Um, and when you don't know them, you're not going to continue to have relationship with them. Only 12% are educated about budgeting. And, and get this, only 5% of the children of high net worth individuals are educated about the broader aspects of wealth. I mean, 95% are not. Um, it's no wonder that 90% you know, of all wealth is dissipated by that third generation. Next, uh, wealth is unpurposed and overwhelming. Um, only about half of high net worth individuals have taken steps to use wealth as in intended. Less than half have clearly identified a purpose um, for their wealth. Um, only about half are very satisfied with how they spend their money. Less than half are satisfied with how they spend their time. Only 19% of higher net worth individuals said that more money would make life better. What they're saying, 81% of them are saying that more money would not make them feel better. And only 4% said more things would make them feel better. Now, I think the financial services industry has recognized this. But I think what they've done is they've tried to, so they've tried to shift to peace and security, but still with a focus on money, right? How many financial ads do you see where they talk about peace and security, but it's still within the context of money? The reality, though, is I think that the lack of peace and security has more to do with relationship than it does with resources. Next, uh, wealth creators don't like traditional estate planning. Among the baby boomers, 72% say that they plan on doing their estate planning differently than their parents. Only 9% have begun transferring wealth. That is a 75% reduction from just the immediate prior generation. Only 3% believe that they owe their children an inheritance. That's an 80% reduction from just the prior generation. And only 10% of high net worth individuals say that their estate plan deals with their goals, their wants, and their objectives. So, so with all of that, we are right now in the midst of the largest financial wealth transfer in the history of the world. We are currently transferring $13 trillion from that greatest silent generation to the boomer generation. Um, but the transfer that is about to begin from the boomers will surpass that by more than threefold. We're about to transfer, beginning the transfer of $40 trillion from one generation to the next. So it's more than three times. And you got to remember, the boomers had about half as many children. So you have about three times as much money going to about half the number of children. So if I had to summarize all of those stats, those figures, those numbers into two sentences, um, this would be it. Undirected and unintentional, unintentional wealth is being transferred at historic rates by procrastinating parents, half of whom have no meaningful plan, and that wealth is going to unprepared heirs or who have no idea what is going on when it comes to their parents' wealth. And their financial professionals, the attorneys, the CPAs, and financial advisors, are doing little to nothing about it. Should we just close in prayer now? Should we just turn this? <laughs> um, 
So, uh, now that I've, I've stated the exciting picture for you as we start this whole day of conference, um, what's the market's response to this? What is the market's response to these re concerns? I think that the market currently focuses on four things. I think they focus on the control of assets. I think they focus on tax efficiency, uh, asset protection, and return on investment. This is what I think a trillion dollar industry, it's, uh, the financial services industry is a trillion dollar industry in the United States. Uh, and I think these are the four pillars uh, that it's built on. So what's the problem with that? Besides setting aside for a minute that it's a complete focus on the assets and the resources, the reality is studies show about 95% of the time financial advisors can't beat the market. 70 to 95% of the time the wealth changes hands at death and the industry itself is slowly becoming more and more commoditized. Every industry, same with my profession. What do I think the market really cares about? I actually think they really care about communication, cohesion, identity, and impact. Now, how do I know this? It's because I've been asking clients four questions, and I'm consistently getting the same questions. So I'm going to ask you guys the same questions, and I want you to answer them uh, in your mind. If you could transfer all of your financial wealth without any tax, or you could have grateful children, what would you pick? If you could average a 12% return on your investments, or you had children who, knew, who were self-reliant, self-sufficient, productive, and mature, what would you pick? If you could completely asset protect all of your assets, or you had children who knew who they were, what they valued, and what they believed, what would you pick? And if you could ensure that your assets were used exactly as you outlined, or that your family was engaged, involved, and connected with each other 50 years from now, what would you pick? You know, whenever I ask clients to pick between preparing their uh, children for their wealth or preparing their wealth for their children, they always pick their children. Now, I'm not saying that those other drivers aren't important. I think that they really are. But if you could help your, ch your, your clients with those four primary drivers, I actually think you would have clients for life when it comes to those secondary drivers, okay? So um, I, I think that the old traditional model of estate planning was asset focused. Give me a list of your assets and um, I will put together an estate plan for you. I think it was tool driven. You know, in, in estate planning, we love our tools, we love our acronyms. We love our crats and cruts and gluts and idgits and digits. Um, I once did a Delaware incomplete gift non-grantor trust, and I added a donor-only non-gifting provision just so I could say I made a ding-dong trust. Um, <laughs> you know, we love our tools. Um, they're also very generic. I would say in 95% of the trusts that I review, if I tore off the first page and I tore off the last page, you'd have no idea whose trust it was. Um, I once reviewed an estate plan for a client who had a $40 million estate. The trust that was to hold all those assets didn't even have the kids' names in it. It simply referred to them as the settler's descendants. Um, and then they're static, too. Uh, they don't change. I think instead, I think we should be beneficiary-focused. I think we should focus more on where the assets are going than how to get them there. I think it should be purpose-driven. We should know why we're doing what we're doing, not just how. I think it should be customized. I think clients should be able to read their estate plan and say, that's me. That's who I am. That's what I value. That's what I believe. And I think it should be dynamic. Families change. Plans should change as well. And so I really think that, that what wealth transfer needs today more than ever is a new paradigm. Um, and I think that th that involves three things. Um, assessing culture, understanding cross currents, articulating purpose, and then taking that and aligning it with a client's planning. So I, so I wanna talk through those, those elements just real quickly. Um, the first is uh, purpose. Purpose comes when you are fully invested in something bigger than yourself. It's got those two critical elements, engagement, 
and transcendence. Um, I love this uh, quote. It says this, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. You know, we need to remember why we're doing what we're doing. Purpose is an intention to accomplish something that is both personally meaningful and leads to engagement with the world, uh, with some aspect of the world beyond the self. It is the sense of direction uh, that you have. And sometimes people get confused with purpose and goals. The, the, the clear, the, the simple explanation of that is if you can accomplish it, it's a goal. If you can never get there, that's a purpose. And we need more purpose uh, in life. The second is um, culture. Okay, the culture is always, purpose is always impacted by culture. Culture is the understood beliefs, attitudes, and actions of a specific group. Culture is really, it's the current that pushes you towards or away from your desired purpose. Um, Culture, I, I like to say it this way, culture is the effect of we on achieving purpose. And there's, there's four key elements uh, or four truisms when it comes to the culture. And that's a culture of a family, the culture of a business, the culture of a church. One is it's shared. Culture cannot exist in a vacuum. I cannot have my own culture. Culture in and of itself is relational. It's pervasive. It affects and permeates everything we do. It's enduring. Uh, a culture of an organization endures. And it's implicit. Um, even though it's subliminal in nature, people are effectively hardwired to react to and understand that. Um, I, this is one of my uh, uh, favorite, favorite examples. Uh, Peter Silliman uh, did an experiment uh, where he took a series of four-person groups at Stanford, University of California, University of Tokyo, and he challenged these four-person groups Uh, to build the tallest possible structure using only four items. 20 pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one yard of transparent tape, one yard of string, and one standard size marshmallow. Okay, And the only requirement was that the marshmallow had to end up on top. Okay, So he looked at these groups and he found this was the same across culture. On average, he worked with business graduates, on average they averaged a... um, a uh, structure about 10 uh, centimeters or, or uh, uh, 10 inches high. Um, so not too bad. I'm proud to say the attorneys on average beat them. Uh, we averaged about 15 uh, inches, so a little bit better. We were, however, uh, beaten by CEOs, uh, CEOs of different companies who on average averaged about 22 uh, inches. All three of those groups, though, across every single study they did uh, um, all over the world, were beaten by a fourth group. Anybody know who that group would be? Kindergartners. Yeah, they were consistently beaten by kindergartners. Um, And so they looked at, uh, how are these kindergartners beating attorneys, CEOs, business graduates? And what they found was that the kids had three critical elements, and they all revolved around culture. One is they, build, they built safety, okay? They found that the parents were, or the adults were competing with each other for position and, and they were trying to focus on their roles. You know what the kids were focused on? Building the structure. And they stood side by side as they did it. Second is that they had a shared vulnerability. Um, the parents, the adults were spending time planning. They were trying not to look foolish How many times in life do we just focus on trying not to look foolish? You know what the kids were doing? They were giving each other positive feedback. Hey, try this. Look, that doesn't work. What about this? They were working together for a common good, and because they went right into it, they started learning right away from their mistakes. And then third is they had a purpose. What they found was in the adults, their purpose was to maintain status and protect their own self-image. The kids were focused on building the structure. Um, Culture is what made the difference in the success of that. Now, there's another set of forces that affect um, the accomplishment of a purpose. And it's what I call uh, cross-currents. And these have a tremendous and oftentimes devastating 
impact. Um, a, a cross current is, um, it is a conflicting tendency. What I like to say is that cross currents are the effect of the reactive me on achieving purpose. Okay, so we have the collective we, but then we also have the reactive me. Um, and these three can dramatically affect uh, uh, the effective wealth transfer. The, the first is worry. Um, that's a perceived future where I see failure. This often leads to control and manipulation. How many times have you heard a client say this? I'm worried about what my wealth will do to my kids. I'm afraid of the impact that this is going to have on them. I don't think that they can handle running the business or managing this wealth. What that does is it leads to control because we don't think that they can do it. The second is regret. That's a perceived past where we failed. And oftentimes that manifests itself in indulgence and lack of expectations. How many times have you heard this? I owe this to the kids because I wasn't there for them. I spent too much time at the business. The marriage failed. And as a result, I, I, um, I need to do this for them. Um, regret often leads uh, to dependent trust fund babies because you're writing checks today to pay for the debts of yesterday. Uh, and then the third, and we're seeing this more and more, and it's, it's paralysis. And paralysis is a perceived present where we are failing, okay? It leads to silence and avoidance. How many times have you heard this? I don't know how to talk to my kids about the wealth. I don't know what to do with this money. I, I feel stuck. Uh, it leads to disconnection and inauthenticity and often becomes inaction. And what we're finding is we have a lot of clients who say, I know how to become wealthy, I don't know how to be wealthy. And those are two different things. Um, and so oftentimes what they do is they end up just going back to making more money because that's something they actually can do and they feel good about it. So they completely uh, avoid this. Um, so what do clients want? I actually think that they want freedom. I think they want a perspective that is transcendent of the past, the present, and the future. When, when I ask my clients this, I invariably get the exact same answer. Um, what I find clients want is having children who are so self-reliant, self-sufficient, productive, and mature that they don't actually need any of the client's money. And yet, so intention, directed, and purposed that they'd be comfortable leaving them everything. When clients hear that, they're like, that's exactly what I want because then I'm free. I'm free to leave it all to them because they're purposed and they will go make an impact in this world. And I'm free to give it all away because I know that they can make it. Um, I think what we should do is help our clients get to freedom. Now, um, I think that there's actually four destinations uh, that, that um, inheritors, uh, that wealth receivers end up in. Um, and so... To, to look at those, I kind of want to go back to that XY graph, uh, and I want to talk about those two variables of um, investment and transcendence. Um, when you have no investment and you have no transcendence, in other words, if I'm not putting anything into something and there's, there's nothing that's bigger than myself, you actually have consumers, okay? Consumers invest little to nothing. They have an inward focus, they live in the present. Their impact is, is really none. Um, and their driver is expectation. Now, I think this is actually what traditional model of estate planning creates. The traditional model, I, I call it the four Ds, right? It, it's the traditional model that we sell 99% of clients is a dump, divide, defer, and dissipate model. The plan is we dump the assets down to the next generation, we divide them up, we try to defer any taxes, and we ultimately dissipate the wealth. And what we say to the kids is, I'm going to give you something that costs you nothing, I'm going to give you no meaning and purpose behind it, and then we're shocked when they consume it. Uh, the average American inheritance, what, it, what families create over the course of their entire life, the average American inheritance is spent in 18 months. 
Um, and the reason it's spent in 18 months is because it's undirected and it costs nothing. In, in 22 years of doing estate planning, if I've learned one fundamental thing, it's this, that we value something based on what it costs us. If something doesn't cost us anything, we simply just don't value it. Um, uh, I was, remember I was walking with my daughter once. We were walking through the mall. Uh, she was like 18 at the time, and she said, Oh, Dad, she goes, I really like that shirt in the window. And I said, well, you have money. You can buy it. And she said, eh, I don't like it my money that much. I, I just like it your money that much. Um, and I said, well, that's the great thing about your money is that you can bring the value proposition to it. Um, now, I will say this, and this is a really important note. I think that sometimes consumers... Of, of wealth are consumers because they've never been asked to invest and they've never been asked what's the meaning, okay? Um, so what if you have transcendence? What if you have something that's bigger than yourself but you either can't or won't invest? Th these are what I call your dreamers, okay? They, dreamers either can't invest because they, they lack the resources. They won't invest or they've never been asked to invest. They have an outward focus. They, they look to the future. Their driver is meaning. Their perspective is to have an enriching life. Um, and again, not as common, but, you, but, but these are people who have a vision for what life can and should be. What if you have someone who's fully invested, uh, but there's not, no transcendence? These are your owners, okay? And we've all had the, the opportunity to work with these people. Great, meaningful people. They are fully engaged. They are fully invested. They have an inward focus. They're in the present. They see the world as it is, and they see the impact that they can make. Their driver is return. They are very enterprising people. Um, these are the builders uh, of the world. Um, but what if... You have both meaningful investment and you have a transcendent purpose. These are what I call the stewards. These are people who are deeply invested. They have an outward focus. They both are living in the present and the future. In other words, they see the world as it is and they see the world as it should be. These people have a profound and lasting impact on the world. Their driver is purpose. They are living their purpose. They are not entitled. They are entrusted. Um, and, and this is a rare group. These are the happiest people in the world. Um, it was interesting. I was working with a client of mine. She was making a massive contribution into a trust that was going to make a uh, multi-generational impact to the entire community. Um, and she was giving up uh, an incredible uh, asset. Um, and I was talking with her about it, and she said, well, it's really easy to do this because I don't own it. And I said, no, actually, you do own it. Like, you, you literally own it. And she goes, no, 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 I am a steward of it. She, didn't, she was not owned by her possessions. One of the fallacies of possessions is that we think we own possessions. The truth is most of the time possessions own us. She was not owned by her possession, so it was really easy for her to, to transfer it because she was a steward and she saw herself as a steward. I have it for a time and then I don't, and so it's easy to give it away. Okay, so how do we create stewards? How do we build stewards? I want to give you, walk away with uh, five practical things uh, that you can do um, in, in, doing, in, in building and creating stewards. So the first is, is draw the map. Um, people, you need to know, um, if you want to go on a journey, you really need to know three things. First, you need to know where you want to go. Second, you need to know where you are. Once you understand those two things, getting there is really easy. It is amazing to me, especially in estate planning, how few people have really any idea of where they want to go, and they, have, they don't really know where they are. 
and yet we have lots of plans and strategies for them on how to get there. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, as you read as you read the four gospels, um, I think one thing becomes abundantly clear about Jesus. Maybe a lot of things become clear, but but one thing in particular, Jesus knew who he was, he knew why he was here, and he knew where he was going. And as you look through all of the encounters and experiences he had with people and the, and the decisions he made along the way, they were pretty easy for him because he knew the answer to those three questions. And so I, I think it, again, it's about purpose, culture, and cross currents. You need to know where you want to go. You need to know where you are today. And you need to know what's affecting your ability to get there. Second is don't focus on money Focus on meaning. There was an interesting study done. It was a, more than, a survey of more than 1.7 million people in 164 different countries. And what they were trying to do is trying to find a correlation between the amount of money people make and the relative level of happiness. And what they found was that the more money you make, the happier you are, but only to a point. And in the United States, that tip uh, hit at about $90,000. And after $90,000, as people made more money, they actually started to see a decrease in the level of perceived happiness. And so the researchers were trying to understand why is that? Why is it not a, why is it not a straight line? Why is it an inverted U-curve? And the researchers uh, hypothesized three reasons. The first is um, the amount of additional work and stress it takes to make that extra money. Okay, so the more money you make, the harder it is, the more work and stress uh, with it. The second is unhealthy social comparisons. What they said was people started to compare their wealth to someone else. I had a client once who was worth, worth about $60 million, and he goes, you know, I, he had eight kids, uh, and he said, you know, when you divide that among eight children, it's really not that much money. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's really not very much. Um, but then the third, and this was the fascinating t to me, is they said at about $90,000 in the United States, depending on where you live, you can cover just about everything you need. And then you switch from what you need to what you want. And what you want is insatiable. What you need can actually be quantifiable. What you want is insatiable. And they said that's when you started to see a decrease in the level of happiness. So um, what are the, the four components uh, of meaning? Um, and, and these are true. I, I think this is... Um, I, I think this is the gospel, but this is also just truisms. There's four critical components to meaning. The first is belonging. Uh, in fact, they said this is the single most important uh, component of meaning, uh, is a sense of belonging, and two critical elements for belonging. The first is uh, relationships of mutual care, and the second is frequent, pleasant interactions. They said those are the two building blocks of, of a sense of belonging. We all have an insatiable need to belong and to connect. Uh, the, second is pur uh, the second is purpose, um, and we've talked a bit about that. Uh, the third um, is transcendence. There has to be something bigger than yourself. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, I, you know, I think we used to spend much of our lives looking up to the stars and the immensity of the sky for direction and purpose and perspective, and unfortunately, for so many uh, in the world today, especially so many among the younger generation, their world is this big. It's as big as their phone. And when the world is small, your problems are big. When the world is big, your problems are actually small. And they, they find it as an inverse correlation. The more time we spend out in nature, the more time we spend thinking of the immensity of the world, of the universe, of God, of purpose... The, actually, the more peace it brings uh, to us. And then the fourth, and I thought this was fascinating, is story. The critical importance of story. Um, is there anything worse in life than a pointless story? Have you ever had anybody just tell you 
a story and you're like, what was the point of that? Why is that? It's because anytime there's a story, we are searching for meaning from it. We want to grasp meaning from it. And, and again, unfortunately, I think in our society today, in our culture today, we don't even know our story. We don't know the story of our, our parents. And one of the things that we really focus on in doing is creating an environment with, with our clients where, where they can share and engage in story uh, and the sharing of, of story. Third uh, is strategy should be the caboose and not the engine, okay? Um, so often when I started estate planning, I thought estate planning was structural, and so that's what I focused on was building structure. What I came to realize is it is a great skeletal system, but it's not the heart and soul. So I, you know, I would focus on things like control, and reducing taxes, and asset protection, and probate avoidance, then I realized that was crap, okay? Um, it's not that that's not important, but the reality is culture will eat strategy for breakfast every single time, okay? I can have a great strategy. Um, what, I love someone who said this, marry the vision, date the strategy, okay? So often, we marry the strategy, and we hope that that will actually impact what we want. No, I have a vision, and then use strategy to accomplish that. There's nothing wrong with good strategy, but it needs to flow from purpose and culture. Fourth, and I think this is a critical one, um, and, and, and so I, I encourage you to write these down. I, I think it's critical that we remove the ambiguity when it comes to the next generation. The next generation, your, your children, your client's children should know the answer to three questions. They should know what to expect in life. They should know what not to expect, and they should know what's expected of them. It's amazing to me how few kids today know the answers to those questions. Uh, and when they don't know the answers to those questions, it leads to paralysis, uh, and, and they don't know what to do. These are actually incredibly freeing uh, questions that if you can answer, if your clients can answer for their kids, can let them go and be who they're meant to be. Um, and when there is ambiguity, they, they often fill those in um, themselves. So um, uh, help, help your clients. Uh, now, I'm not, and again, I'm not saying get out the financial statement, show every single thing to the kids. The level of transparency that comes to this uh, is up to the client, but still the point is the client, kids need to know and understand those things. And then fifth is, I mentioned earlier the four Ds, dump, divide, defer, and dissipate. I think we should replace it with the four Ps, uh, and that is purpose, which I've talked about. Participation. We should invite kids to participate in the business, participate in um, the, the investments and activities of the family. We should prepare the kids. Uh, again, I think we need to spend more time preparing kids for wealth than we, than we do preparing wealth for kids. Um, I think we have it backwards. And, and fourth, it's about perspective. Um, I had a client once, they were heading to Hawaii. They had rented a beach house for $25,000 a week. They were going there for two weeks. And they said, look, I, we don't want our kids to get the wrong perspective in life, so we're making them fly coach. Um, so mom and dad flew first class, but the kids flew coach. I'm like, oh, that'll keep them grounded. Um, they'll be fine. Um, it's amazing to me. And, and again, it's understandable. Um, I grew up in a house. We were not wealthy by any stretch. I was a latchkey kid. I never went to the refrigerator and wondered if there'd be food in there. You know, if I tore my jeans, I knew my mom would get me another pair of jeans. Okay, that is not the life of everyone who lives. Uh, we heard that earlier uh, today. Uh, helping your kids have a proper perspective in life um, actually leads not only to gratitude, but to a chance of transcendence and a, and a possibility that they have to, to impact the world. So I want to end with just a quick example of what this can look like uh, and if we actually focus on these things. Um, but the model, I think, should be this. I think purpose should actually drive the planning that we do, and planning should support the purpose. Too often, 
the driver in estate planning is the assets or the business. The assets drive the planning, the planning supports the assets, and purpose is somewhere off to the side and family is somewhere off to the side. When you do that, you actually end up losing both. You lose the family and you lose the assets. Um, so um, I'll give you an example. In, in, in our situation, we sat down with a client um, and the huge thing that we want to do is foster and facilitate communication. Um, and and it, it was interesting. Uh, in 1999, Time Magazine recognized Jesus as the most influential person to ever live in the history of the world, Time Magazine. Um, generally regarded as the greatest or one of the greatest teachers of all time, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, it's just inarguable. What's fascinating is this. Um, if you look at the four Gospels, Jesus asked 305 questions. He was asked 183 questions. He only directly ever answered eight. So you think about it. The greatest teacher in the history of the world only answered eight questions. And he asked a hundred and or he asked 305 and was asked 183. Now, how could he be recognized as the greatest teacher when that's all he did? Now, um, I should just leave that as a question, but since I'm not Jesus, I'm going to give an answer. Um, <laughs> I think that Jesus realized that knowledge, facts, and data inform, questions and stories transform. Okay? And I think... And it's interesting, our, our phones have access to virtually every piece of information ever assembled in the history of human, humanity. And yet so many of us don't know who we are, what we value, and what we believe. I think that's why as professionals, we need to stop giving clients answers and we need to start asking them questions, okay? So in this example, that's what we did. Uh, and it was, it was really interesting um, they said that, look, we're concerned our kids don't value what we value, um, that they aren't going to appreciate uh, what we transfer to them. But then, you know what, we talked with the kids, uh, and they said, look, one of the most fascinating things is they said, look, mom and dad, um, we don't want you to give us your wealth. We want you to tell us how to become wealthy. We want you to teach us how to make our own money. We want to collaborate with you. And you know what? What this relationship means way more to us than your money. It was a transformative conversation that they had just never engaged in. Um, we added purpose to their planning. We helped them articulate uh, their um, uh, values and their purposes. Um, and then we helped them establish just three simple goals. I love Parkinson's Law. It says this, the amount of time allocated to a task is the amount of time it takes to complete a task, Right? You need to set clear, measurable goals which help you get to your purpose. So for this family, they identified uh, five core values. Um, they were connection, empathy, faith, gratitude, and integrity. We took those and we built that into their estate planning. So we actually set it, created a fund where the family could always get together, where there could be a time of connection every year, annual family retreat. They resourced it, and they started to engage in it. They actually set aside funds for uh, charitable gift matching. They wanted to encourage and support adoption, so they created a multi-generational fund within the family to support and encourage adoption and charitable service. Um, and then um, they actually, uh, one of my favorite things they did is that they actually created a family LLC. They had the kids earn a little bit of money so that they had investment. The parents then leveraged that with a nine to one loan at 1%. And then they said, look, let's work together to create, uh, to, what should we do with those funds? Should we invest it in stocks, bonds, mutual funds? Should we, should we take those and then put it into real estate? In other words, what they said is, we will teach you how to use some things so that you are capable to deal with more things. And I wonder where they got that from, right? Um, so often in estate planning, instead we do nothing, 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 silence, avoidance, silence, avoidance, and then we give kids incredible sums of unearned wealth right after mom and dad die, and we're shocked when it turns out poorly. Um, 
What kids want is engagement, and they want education, and they want to have an investment, uh, and they want to learn. Um, so I, I think the model is to prepare kids, uh, establish a plan of financial transparency, model interdependence, and not independence, not dependence, interdependence, nurture family unity, and build a legacy. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thanks.